Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So just as a quick thing, just to mention, as I was mentioning to the class a moment ago, remember your take-home test is out. Uh, please complete it by the end of Sunday. Uh, so that is available. And if you have any questions or concerns or need clarifications, just bug me by email. I'm very happy to answer those things. So anyways, I want to bring us back to where we were last day. I, don't, I did a whole bunch of setup the last couple of lectures. So I'm hoping that this time I'm going to go boom, 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 go through a bunch of interesting results for you. So last day I was setting up this table that's going to enumerate all the possible languages effectively for a, any given Turing machine. And last day, I showed you how I can take any Turing machine and I can encode it as a positive integer and vice versa. And I define this peculiar language to you called the diagonalization language. And it's defined as I have given it up here. It's self-referential in the sense that WI could be in fact a description of itself. So that is indeed going to be a very real thing you have to watch out for because it's a it's a it's it's an interesting characterization uh, that we're going to be looking at the set of of binary strings. Remember, wi represents the ith binary string. Just remember that from last day. And I'm going to be giving you this table. So the table is going to enumerate for all the possible Turing machines a vector, and this vector is going to be read as the rows. And each row, in all effects, represents the language of machine MI, where row I represents a Turing machine. So remember, as we go down this way, each of these rows represents a Turing machine. Each WJ represents a binary string. So I ended off last day asking you about what does it mean if I told you, okay, if I wanted to know if wi is in the language mi. So that's where I left off last day. Where is that located in this table? Yeah, it's the diagonal, exactly, exactly, perfect. It's the diagonal. So we have to be very careful when we talk about this because this construction is a little, it's, it, it's interesting because it, remi it should remind you a little bit of when we were doing our infinite binary sequence example. So if I tell you, okay, so this diagonal, so this seems like to be the interesting part of this for us at least. So this is the diagonal we're going to be interested in. So if I say that this is a one, in this case it's a zero, but if it were a one, then we know that MI accepts WJ. So since they're in the same position, then it's saying that MI accepts WI. So I have a question for you. What is in fact the diagonalization language? So remember, if we read off one of these entries, it tells us this information, if it's in fact a one. If it's a one, this is indeed going to be the case. So what if what, what I need to do to this so it looks like that? Think back to the first diagonalization example I showed you. This is a very important part of this proof. So instead of having it where I have a one, what should I consider instead? So what would this mean if I were to think about it in terms of this table and the diagonal? It means zero, right? So here's the interesting thing to also observe. If I told you these rows are what we are calling characteristic vectors, and each one of these represents a language for a Turing machine. Indeed, if I assume that this is all the Turing machines, then if I give you, say, uh, say right here, each one of these rows, it's a language for some machine. If I look at this diagonal, 
you'd agree with me that each one of this, because this is W1, that's W2, W3, W4 for Turing Machine 1, Turing Machine 2, Turing Machine 3, Turing Machine, sorry, Turing, Turing Machine 4. I'm getting very excited about this. So would you agree with me that if I read this diagonal off, that maybe I can create another characteristic vector if I'm a bit careful about this? So, so how create, how can we create a new characteristic vector? Does everybody, anybody see it? Remember back to when we did the diagonalization example, what did I do to construct a new binary sequence there for my contradiction? What did I do to every time I seen a position in the diagonal, what did I do for that position in the sequence? Could somebody tell me? So think about it. If I have a zero, what should I consider instead? Flip it to one. Yeah, remember we flipped the bits. The same idea here. That's all you do. Same exact idea. So look at the diagonal. And take its complement. So you just, every time you see a one, you turn it into a zero. If you see a zero, you turn it into a one. So for example, if I look at that example I have over there, what I'm telling you is that I would call this one, zero, zero, because the diagonal here is zero, one, one, one. So what is this saying? Just to be clear, what it's saying is that, that epsilon is in is an LD. It's saying, sorry, it's saying e epsilon is in the language. I don't want to get there quite yet. So it's in some language. It's saying that zero is not in some language. And then this is saying that one is not in some language. Sorry, I apologize for the writing of this. And then zero, uh, let's say zero, zero because that would be the fourth string. This isn't the language. So this is just saying that I'm just going through each of the binary strings by their order that I gave you the other day. So epsilon would be in the language here. Zero would not be in the language. One would not be in the language and zero, zero would not be in the language. That's what it says. It, like I said, it kind of melted there. My apologies. Uh, so what I want to ask you is what exactly is this L right here? What is L? What is that? Think about it like the way I told you what this means as a characteristic vector. What is this? If you think about it as a characteristic vector. What is it? If I complement all of the positions along the diagonal, and remember the diagonal represents WI is in a language of MI. So all I've done is I've made the complement, so now it looks like this. But it's right there, right? So, so that means what language have I just characterized? Well, it's not the complement of LD, it is actually LD itself, believe it or not. Because remember, the diagonal itself is just W, uh, like if it's one, then you know that WI is in fact in the language. When I complement it, it looks like this, but that's it right there, right? But yeah, so this, this is actually just L. So, so this is the diagonalization language, believe it or not. So this is where it gets a little strange, right? 
Because I've talked about like, okay, infinite binary sequences. I had something missing, right? So remember, the assumption is, is that this lists all the possible Turing machines. So where's LD in this table? <laughs> well, by the very similar reasoning I showed you the other day involving the binary sequences, it's not in the table. Does everybody see that? So, I'm, uh, so, so let's see, can you go over from the example? So suppose I have over here. So just to give you clarity of what I'm doing here. So if I were to consider Turing machine number one, this is saying that the first binary string, this is epsilon, by the way. So this would be a Turing machine that its description is epsilon. When I consider as input epsilon, and it's saying, oh yeah, no, that doesn't work. And then if I see a one, that means it's going to accept on that string. This is going to accept on that string and so on. This is no different than when I read the diagonal because the diagonal is just simply going through each one of the binary strings that I have as the input here. And all I'm doing is just grabbing one from each of the rows here. And I'm, because I complement it, because I know if I make this into a one, I know it doesn't match this row at all. Meaning it actually describes a different language. If I go to this one and I change this to a zero, because this position originally was in fact a one, most certainly it's gonna be the case that now it doesn't equal this one. And it's gonna follow through a very similar set of construction just like the one I showed you the other day for the binary sequences. So I want to walk you through how you'd prove this, because this is just an idea, right? I want to actually prove it for you. So let me go to the proof here. And believe it or not, the proof is actually quite simple, which is very strange given the weirdness of this proof, <laughs> or at least this idea. So remember, the idea is going to be very similar to what I did when I did diagonalization that other time. I'm going to assume that because remember, I want to show you that this language, this diagonalization language, is not recursively enumerable. And remember, the definition of recursively enumerable is quite simple. It means that there exists a Turing machine that recognizes that language, right? So if I'm going to do this, I'm going to use contradiction again. I'm going to assume that there's a Turing machine that does indeed recognize the diagonalization language. And then I'm going to show you that it's not actually in that table. Because if it in fact is the case that it is, the fact that there is a Turing machine of the kind, it will be listed in that table. It will be some of the, one of those Turing machines. And you're gonna see that it's gonna make a whole lot of no sense um, when I actually try assuming this. So here's the theorem. LD is not recursively enumerable. So just to be very clear, that's me saying no Turing machine recognizes, recognizes the diagonalization language. That's what we're gonna prove. So what does this mean? Just to give you a big picture look, this means that there exists languages that you will never be able to capture with a Turing machine. That's the fundamental aspect of this result. That's at least one of them. We're going to see another application of this in a moment. So assume there is a Turing machine. So assume that there is a Turing machine M where the language of M is equal to the, the diagonalization language. So LD is over the binary alphabet. So this is why I need the Turing machine to be also encoded in binary in terms of uh, what I'm describing to you. It's because the diagonalization language itself is binary. So it's over some binary alphabet. It's over the binary alphabet. So M must be must be in the list, in the list 
of all Turing machines with input alphabet with input alphabet 0, 1. So just to be clear, when I say the list of all Turing machines, that's the table. So, because we've assumed that the diagonalization language is in fact recognizable by some Turing machine, that means that it exists in one of the rows of the table. So, there is at least at least one code, at least one code for M. Let this, let this be I so that the machine M is equal to MI. Now, because it is in fact a language that we're interested in, it's either going to be that that my my uh, my input string wi is either going to be in the diagonalization language or it is not going to be. There's only those two possibilities. So by division of cases, I'm going to list these two. It must be that either wi is in the diagonalization language or wi is not in the diagonalization language. And we have two cases. So we have two possibilities that could happen. So I'm going to show you that we're going to get a contradiction for each one of the two cases. And I assure you they're going to look very weird. Uh, so here's the first case. So assume that we have wi is in the diagonalization language. That's case one. Then what does that mean? If you follow through the reasoning here, assuming that there is this Turing machine, then MI accepts WI. Well, if it accepts WI, what does that mean if it's the diagonalization language? Can somebody tell me? What does it imply? So, so remember, if MI accepts WI, what's the diagonalization language say? No, 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 we're, we're keeping it, we're trying, we're not, uh, so remember, remember, what is the diagonalization language? So remember our definition, it is that that it has to be that WI is not in the language of the ith Turing machine. So, if I tell you that MI accepts WI, what does that actually mean? And I tell you, it's absolutely going to make no sense whatsoever. Can somebody tell me? Any ideas? Yeah, it does. It can't. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, exactly. But this implies WI is not in the diagonalization language as the diagonalization language LD contains, contains only strings, only strings WJ where MJ does not accept does not accept, except WJ, right? Well, it is a literal contradiction. Uh, if you ever heard of the story, uh, heard the idea of, the, uh, it's called the Barber's Paradox. The same setup of the Barber's Paradox is literally this proof. <laughs> um, so if you were to take the logic of something called the Barber's Paradox, it's, 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 it's an interesting puzzle in its own right, but it's, it's really just a, a, an exercise in that if you presume something that can't actually exist, you can get internal contradictions that are self-referential like this. Um, I would encourage you to take a look into what is called the Barber's Paradox when you get some time, but it, it's literally the same setup. <laughs> it's, so 
we're going to have this first case where we get a bunch of nonsense, right? So if I accept it, then most certainly it can't be because the diagonalization language says by definition it can't, right? So this is indeed a contradiction. The other possibility, and this one's even easier, suppose that WI is not in the diagonalization language. So that means that MI does not accept WI. Then, then MI does not accept, accept WI, implying, what does this imply now though? If MI doesn't accept WI, what does that mean? This, this is very, this seems like a whole bunch of nonsense, right? What, what does this mean? <laughs> Yeah, it is. So it so if it does so if Duff if, if the machine does not accept WI, then it must be in the diagonal language, right? <laughs> the diagonalization language. Implying implying by the definition by the definition of LD LD WI is in the diagonalization language. So what does that mean? What does that mean if, if we have not, this is a contradiction, this is a contradiction. These are the only two possibilities that can happen here. So what does that mean? So we get a contradiction in both cases. So what can we say about M? Because what does it mean if this is if if I'm assuming this? And I'm telling you, it doesn't exist. Exactly. So I'm just gonna put the last bit down below here. It's not a part of point two. So since there is a contradiction. In both cases. M cannot exist. M cannot exist. But what does that mean? What does that mean? If there's no Turing machine that does this, what does that mean by definition then? And so remember, M, th there is no such M that's going to be able to recognize the diagonalization language. So what does that mean? I'm not gonna write the final sentence because I ran out of space here. But what is the conclusion here? That the diagonalization language is not recursively enumerable. And that's the end of the proof. Fundamental result. So, so I must stress that RE means recursively enumerable up there. I use it as a, remember I, def I said that that's what uh, recursively enumerable is abbreviated as. Hopefully that clarifies that. But it's not, le it's not regular, just to be clear. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this, so just the big idea here is that this is actually the first language I've shown you in this course where there is no Turing machine that recognizes it. So more certainly if there does not recognize it, there is no algorithm that if you were to tell me, hey, look, is there some decider that can decide this language? The answer is most certainly not, <laughs> right? So we know that this language will cause you some problems. And you might say, Dan, well, this seems like a really strange language. Why should I care about this language? I'm going to show you how I'm going to use this language to pop holes in things that people would really like to have for their computers, but we can't have them, okay? So, so this is me coming along and being kind of like the reverse of Santa Claus. <laughs> and I'm going to be coming along, taking all those optimistic presents from all the happy kids, and I'll be like, hey, look, you thought you could do that with a computer? No, nah, no, nah, you can't do that with a computer. I don't know if that makes me Krampus or I'm not quite sure. I, I assure you I don't put the children in my bags, okay? <laughs> so, so anyways, the point here is that
Now I've given you a language that there's gonna be no Turing machine that's gonna recognize it. That most certainly means that there's no algorithm in that informal sense either that even could decide it. So that brings me to talking about the idea that there could exist an undecidable problem that actually is recursively enumerable. So if you might say, okay, well, if it's recurs and not recursively enumerable, then most certainly there's no algorithm for it. If I gave you a problem and I tell you it's not recursively enumerable, you know there's no algorithm for solving that problem, correct? Just to bring everything together. I'm going to show you that it's a little bit more nuanced than just that. That there actually do exist problems that actually are undecidable, but actually there does exist a way to recognize it. Which is very weird. <laughs> so, just as a reminder, so recall, recall that a language, a language L is recursive, is recursive if there exists, if there exists, if there exists a Turing machine M with L is equal to the language of the machine M, so that so that we have two possibilities. If W is in the language, then then M accepts. So M is going to accepts, and it of course halts as a consequence of this. Or the other possibility is that is that W is not in the language, then M eventually, eventually halts in a non-final state, right? That's, that's what we said, that's what recursive means, is that there exists a decider. And this is what a decider is. It's just, it has to satisfy these two properties. So, remember, this, as I said in a previous lecture, this is our informal notion of an algorithm. So, whenever you take an, take an algorithms class, it's usually this notion, because we want our algorithms to always terminate in finite time and produce an answer, right? So, this is the kind of Turing machines that are very interesting for people that design algorithms, because we always want to make sure our algorithms terminate in finite time, right? At least when we're trying to solve a conventional decision-based problem, for example. Or say, for example, I want to compute my favorite problem. I want to make sure that I have it so that it always will terminate in finite time, right? I don't want to have it where sometimes for some of the inputs it causes it to have some infinite loop happen, which is something that a recognizer is capable of. So a Turing machine that doesn't have this strict property, meaning that it could potentially, when the W is not in the language, it just recognizes it, as in this first case, but here it may run infinitely, as in going on forever and ever and ever, or it may halt, I'm not sure, but there's only these two possibilities that, and this is the where we're going to be interested in things. Okay, so just as a reminder, remember if it means, if I tell you a language is not recursive, and remember, Languages and problems are entwined with each other at this stage. So when I talk about a problem, I'm talking really about a language in a formal way. So if I tell you that L is not recursive, another way you can say this is that L as a problem is undecidable. So that's the typical terminology that gets used. So if somebody talks to you about a problem and they say it's undecidable, that means that there exists no algorithm that solves it. So, has everybody got the general gist? So, some of this I've already said in the past. I just want to remind you. So, that brings me to talking about something a little different. I want to describe a couple properties for you. I'm going to leave the proofs for these in the notes so you can take a look at them just for the sake of time because I want to make sure I get to the next result here. So here's a couple of theorems that I want you to be aware of. So the first theorem that I want to point out to you is that if L is recursive, 
if L is recursive, then so, so is L bar. So note this is it's the complement of L. So what I'm saying is that if you're considering recursive languages, they're closed under complement. And you might ask, Dan, how is this the case? Well, there's a very simple way you can actually modify the Turing machines so that you guarantee that the complement will accept. You effectively, you swap the, you take the, the final states, you stop them from being final states, you create a brand new state, you call that the accepting state. And remember, our Turing machines, when they halt, when they halt, which we can guarantee because it is recursive. Remember, we had those, we had a, tra we don't have a, de a definition for a transition, right? Remember on our tables, we had those blank spots? All I'm saying is, for each pair of those, you're just simply going to introduce a transition that takes, that takes you from where you would normally reject to this new final state. And that's actually how you can build the Turing machine in this case, a decider that accepts the complement. But I'm going to leave the details for you to check out in the in the uh, notes there. It's it's an interesting construction. So here's another theorem. So if both a language L and its complement and its complement, L bar, are recursively enumerable. Now, just watch this carefully. This is a very weird but interesting property. Are recursively enumerable, are recursively enumerable, then L and L bar are recursive. Strange, right? <laughs> this is very strange. But it actually makes weird sense, like a really strange sense. Because what I'm telling you is that if L and its complement are recursively enumerable, then there exists a decider that actually can decide L, and there's also another decider that ex decides L bar. So you might ask, how is that even possible? I'm going to give you a fun picture just to illustrate how you do this. The proof has more details about this, but watch this. So I'm going to imagine I have two Turing machines. So imagine I have the input W that gets fed to my Turing machine as input, it's placed on the tape. And suppose I have M1 and I have another Turing machine, M2. And because M1 and M2, so M1, by the way, I'm gonna assume that the Turing machine M1 is so that, that the language of M1 is equal to L, and the Turing machine M2 is so that the language of M2 is equal to L bar. So, because I'm allowed to have this because both of these are recursively enumerable. So, this is where it gets a little weird. Because remember, M1 and M2 both can recognize those languages over there. And we care to make sure that in fact, they're going to be recursive. Now, I must stress the second part here actually follows as a consequence of the previous theorem. Because I told you that if L is recursive, then so is L bar. So let's just only look at L here. So remember, L itself is recursively enumerable. And so is this complement. So you know that the machine is definitely going to halt if it accepts that language, correct? So if it accepts, there's most certainly it's going to be the case that it halts, right? Does everybody get that? So remember, M1 and M2, they will both halt if it accepts for that language, right? Now you might ask, Dan, how do, you, how do you even have it so that you're building a new Turing machine? I'm going to call this new Turing machine M. 
Well, what you do is you run both the Turing machines in parallel. That means you're going to have, so one way you can get this is that you can always build a multi-tape Turing machine where we have one tape being the tape of M1 and then the other tape being the tape of M2. And then you can effectively simulate both of these happening at the same time using a breadth first search based approach. Similar to, remember when I talked about where I basically emulated a queue? That other day when I was talking about non-deterministic Turing machines, it's very similar idea. So you'll have some other tape that's going to do all the scrap work in between. Uh, but this is just to give you a high level view of this. So if it accepts here. So remember, if both of these, they will accept and they will halt, right? So for M1, we're okay here. So all you're going to do is if this halts, then you most certainly want to make sure it accepts, right? Because that would mean that we have a string that's in the language, right? But if that accepts, M2 accepts, what should you should do? What do you need to do if M2 accepts? So what should M do overall if M2 accepts? Because remember what M2 is, M2, its language is the complement of L. So if this case I'm accepting, what should I do here? I should reject. You reject, exactly. You reject. But notice now I've just designed it. I designed a decider for you, right? It's just a decider right here. Because you can guarantee that one of these two is going to definitely stop. Is that kind of neat? So it's a very interesting construction. If you want more of the details, I'm going to have that in the notes for you. But just be aware of the where be aware of these two properties. We're going to use them. So let's talk a little bit about where we're going with this. So here we go. I'm going to define what is called the universal language. So I said last day I was going to talk a little bit about the universal Turing machine a little bit more carefully today, which is what I'm doing right now. And then I'm going to show you another devastating result. <laughs> Oops, I, I'm hitting my, my, cute, my cute, cute little whale dolphin thing, my jigger. Okay, so let me... Just make sure I don't lose everybody. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to define what is called the universal language. And this is actually how I will characterize the universal Turing machine. So we're going to call it LU. That's what we're going to call it. So this is the definition. It's very simple the set of binary strings of binary strings that encode a pair M W where M is a Turing machine with the binary alphabet, with the binary alphabet, and and oh, here's the here's the fun that's going to be a little different than we had last time. This is what I was alluding to the other day, is that now we're going to have a binary string W. That's going to be the input for this machine, where. We're going to assume that W is, in fact, in the language of the machine. So you're going to have a pair. And this is going to be encoded. So we're going to have the description of a Turing machine. And we're going to have a description of the input that you'd give the Turing machine. So remember last day I mentioned that the way you would encode this would be that you would have your encoding of the Turing machine. Then you'd have three ones and then you'd have W. So you'd have W. And then it would have M right here. So that's what I'm referring to. So this is the set of binary strings that I'm referring to. 
And each, and indeed, each one of these will in fact be some binary string. And now I gotta define the universal Turing machine for you. The universal Turing machine U is where the universal language equals the language of the universal Turing machine. Now you might ask, Dan, what does that mean? That means it's going to be actually the collection, so it's gonna be a set of all of those possible encodings of those pairs. So there's a Turing machine, and then there's the input for that Turing machine, and you do this for all possible pairs of Turing machines and their possible input strings. And that's what this universal language is for the universal Turing machine. And this is actually why I suggested to you that the universal Turing machine can be thought of as a stored program computer. Because now I've described to you effectively a language for which if you gave it an arbitrary Turing machine with some input, this machine will simulate that. And then if it halts, then most certainly it will belong to the universal language. Because the way we define W, W has to belong to the language of M. So the intuition is very simple. It's just like if you're actually using a very real computer, right? Because if you think about it, okay, if I give you input and a machine and it indeed accepts, you know that that, term, that program's going to terminate, correct? What do you normally do when you're not sure about if a program is going to finish or not? You kind of just sit there and wait, right? That intuition's exactly what you should imagine right here. Okay, and if you're wondering, now this is the technical part about the universal Turing machine. The universal Turing machine itself is a Turing machine, which is, which is very interesting. So where we have this, um, any universal Turing machine, U, can be described easier as a multi-tape Turing machine. And if you want the details about this, I'll refer you to chapter 9.2.3 of the Hopcroft book. They go into all the nitty gritty details about this. All you need to know for the sake of our proof is the following. is as a consequence of this, LU is recursively enumerable. Does everybody see why? It's because if it indeed halts, it halts for the original machine M, in the original Turing machine with that input W, right? But I've described to you that there is a way actually I can equivalently describe the universal Turing machine as a multi-tape Turing machine which we know is also equivalent to our classic interpretation of a Turing machine, right? So most certainly if I give you some Turing machine, if it accepts on here, meaning it's going to always halt, it's most certainly gonna recognize the universal language. So is everybody okay with that? So this universal language is actually recognizable. It means it's recursively enumerable. So, that's the thing you need to know about this. So just to give you intuition about this, so it's just like a typical computer program, except it's very much a mechanical thing you can imagine. You can't really stop it once you start it, okay? You can't just go like all control delete on your Windows machine or something like that. You can't do that with this machine. It just kind of just runs on forever. So. I'll give you a little bit more detail in the notes if you're curious about this, but what I would like to use the last bit of time here with is to show you another devastating result, okay? This one is actually something that is very tangible and very real. And if we have time, I wanna talk briefly about one other connected problem to this. I'm hoping that we'll have time. If not, I'm hoping that you might be able to give me a couple of minutes to quickly mention it, because it's a very classic aspect of this. Okay, so here's the 
here's the kind of the me coming along being being that bad old Santa coming on in and saying, hey, look, I see that present there. I'm going to take it from you. <laughs> Watch this. Here's the theorem. Here's the theorem. A universal language is not recursive. That means there, there is no decider for this language. So in very real terms, what I'm telling you is that you cannot design an, a computer program, assuming the Church Turing thesis, which is pretty much pretty good, at least at this stage, um, that takes in an, the description of an arbitrary program and an arbitrary input for which it halts and tells you whether the pro, like you can't determine if this machine is going to always halt or not. As in, it accepts or rejects. Very weird, right? But it's a very fundamental result. This means that you can't design all sorts of fun things to check your programs. There's only very restricted circumstances for which you can do this. So you always have to specialize. You can't have this nice, beautiful thing where somebody gives you this all glorious compiler that tells you your program can always halt or not halt, okay? That's that's the that's what I'm saying. It's uh this is this is actually devastating for some people. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to assume LU is recursive. Because it's recursive, that means that I can also use one of the theorems I told you earlier. Then L bar of U, so L U of bar, I mean the complement of the universal language is also recursive under our assumption. Because this is from a theorem that, this is from the, the theorem earlier. Then there has to be a decider. There is a decider M with uh, with where the language of M is in fact going to be the complement of the universal language. Now, here's where things are going to get very strange. I told you that diagonalization language, I told you it was going to be very important here. And this is where I'm going to use it. So we can build, we can build a Turing machine, M prime, let me just write this a little more carefully, M prime, so it's going to be M prime, using M, so under the assumptions that M is in fact going to be a decider. that accepts the diagonalization language. So under this assumption, I'm gonna show you how I could build a Turing machine that's going to accept the diagonalization language. And it's very simple, surprisingly, but it's very strange. So what I'm gonna assume that M prime is going, is going to do the following. It's going to, M prime changes given w as input, so it's going to be given as input some w. It's going to change the input to the following. The input to w, 1, 1, 1, w. So the input, the input to m prime is the description is the description of M with input that is also the description of M. Oh, ooh, that's that's a little bad, right? What is that? Can somebody tell me, please, what is that? What is that? <laughs> so I've described to you, so this is what I'm going to be basically giving. So you think of this as the input of the universal Turing machine. And now it has W and W. So it takes the description of M 
With input, that's also the description of M. But what is that? Somebody tell me? What is that? That looks awfully similar to LD, but it's not quite there. I need to make one small little step. But it's essentially it. So M prime simulates, remember this is just the thing with the universal Turing machine. M prime simulates M with the new input. With the new input, then if W is WI, so remember the ith binary string, then M prime can determine can determine whether MI accepts WI. Since, since M decides the complement of the universal language, it accepts it accepts if and only if, if and only if, if and only if, MI does not accept WI, i.e. WI is in the diagonalization language. Now this is where it gets a little weird. Let me just wrap this up. However, 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 this implies, this implies that M prime accepts W, accepts W if and only if, I'm just abbreviating if and only if, if and only if W is in the diagonalization language. And there is no Turing machine. There is no Turing machine that recognizes, that recognizes LD. So what does that mean? So I have effectively given you a description for how I can build a, a Turing machine that can effectively recognize LD. But what does that mean? If I told you that LD, there is no Turing machine that does this, right? There is no such Turing machine. So what does that mean? Somebody please tell me, then we'll stop. There is no Turing machine, right? So let's so let's uh, let's do this. Therefore, therefore, M prime cannot exist. M prime cannot exist, and because I've assumed that L U is recursive, and I showed you there's a, a problem with that. There's you can't do that. There's a contradiction, and. I'm running out of space again. And LU, sorry, LU is not recursive. Oh no, I'm running out of space. Not recursive. There we go. So just to reiterate what I have here. However, this implies that M prime accepts W if and only if W is in the diagonalization language. And there is no Turing machine that recognizes LD. Therefore, M prime cannot exist and L is, sorry, LU is not recursive. That's a consequence of that. So, so just be aware that this is a nice classic result of computability theory. I want to mention one small thing is that there's a version of this one. Uh, you may know it under a different name. It's called the halting problem. So classically when Alan Turing was looking at his automatic machines in the 30s, uh, he, he defined his Turing machines by acceptance by halting. That means that the machine accepts if, the, if it halts. So a way you can classify or cl 
basically take our universal language is equivalently define the Turing machine by so that it accepts by halting. Um, and then you can ask the same kind of question I just did here. And you use a very similar technique that Alan Turing used in his classic paper on computable numbers um, in regard to the Einstein doom problem. It's a German word for decision problem and use a technique quite similar to this one. So if you want more details about this, I'm going to put a little bit in the notes about this. But the whole idea here is that I showed you, assuming some contradiction, of course, that I was able to use another undecidable problem to help me show another problem was undecidable. So that's where we're going to be going next with this. Is I'm going to, now I have a couple of undecidable problems. What can I do with that? So that's where we're going to go next time. Okay, everybody? I apologize for going a little longer here today, but I'm hoping that the bang was worth it, okay? So I want to say thank you very much, and have yourself a wonderful weekend, and all the best of luck on the test, okay? So I'll stick around for any other questions, and I'll see everybody later, okay? So have yourself a beautiful day.